Welcome to the first course stream of the Romans of the Three Kingdoms, or Sangwa Yan Yi. Before I get started with our wonderful novel, a couple of announcements. Uh, the opening slide of our PowerPoint is always going to be the announcement page. Um, I will always post the PowerPoints of my lecture to iLearn so that you can review them for one of the two review quizzes, which is always based on the lectures, the other one being based on the readings. The PowerPoint and my lectures will also provide you with some ideas for the reading responses. Um, I want you this week, if you haven't done so yet, to take a look at that sample reading response and the rubric that I've posted to iLearn. Now, just for the first week, I will post the first 34 chapters of the novel on iLearn. Some of you have told me that you haven't been able to get hold of your books yet. So I will do that um, just, for, just for the first week. And finally, please email me with any questions or concerns that you have. Okay, let's quickly go over this slide. We've looked at that already last week, and we talked about our author, Luo Guanzhong, who compiled this wonderful work in the 14th century, um, mostly based on scripts or huaben that had been used for storytelling. So it's a story that, that had been around for a long time and that he essentially compiled. We know that it is based on historical events, right, on true events, and as such, it really is just a slight fictional elaboration of history. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's set during the late Han Dynasty, the Han Dynasty being the first great dynasty, the first great empire in Chinese history, sort of uh, rivaling the Roman Empire in terms of length and size and, and power that it had accumulated. It consists of 120 chapters in its unabridged form, but we are, of course, reading it in an abridged version, right? But even though it's abridged, there's still a lot of characters in there, close to a thousand characters. Not all of them are of equal importance, and we will really just focus on uh, the most important ones. Um, something else we will talk about in more detail next week is the fact that the novel reflects Confucian views of society as they were prevalent in the 14th century. This is interesting because even though these events are set during the Han Dynasty in the 2nd and 3rd century, we really have to think of the novel more in many ways being a reflection of the prevalent political and philosophical ideas of the 14th century. Again, we'll, we'll uh, talk more about that in detail. Um, the novel gained huge popularity all over Asia and has found its way into the popular culture in those respective countries, be it China, be it Korea, be it Japan. So it's not just a work that has lived on in literary form, but it has lived on in painting, as we can see here on the left. It has lived on in theater, in opera, uh, in poetry, and of course in the contemporary period it lives on in movies, and manga, uh, and computer games. Now if you want to learn more in detail about the novel. I have posted uh, a chapter from a scholarly work called The Classic Chinese Novel by a scholar called Si Xia to iLearn, and you will find a chapter on each of the three novels that we're reading, The Three Kingdoms, Journey to the West, and Dream of the Red Chamber. Now, here we have a map of China, of today's China in yellow, and superimposed on that big map uh, is a map slightly smaller of our three kingdoms. The three kingdoms, how they stood at the end of that period, at the end of that three kingdoms period, when those three kingdoms actually all had been founded. We have the Wei kingdom, or Cao Wei, in the north, and it's usually associated with Cao Cao, who is one of the main characters in our novel. If you've already started to read the novel, uh, you, you'll certainly have encountered him. If you haven't, then you will. And he is a name that you absolutely have to remember. He is one of our main protagonists. We have the kingdom of Shu, or Shu Han, 
it's uh, the green part, right? Here on the left, Chengdu, modern day Chengdu. So it's, you know, it's in Sichuan, what is today Sichuan. And it is the kingdom that is associated with Liu Bei, uh, another one of our main heroes in the novel and somebody we will encounter right away in chapter one. And then there is the kingdom of Wu or Sun Wu uh, in the south and uh, you know along the, the, the Yangtze, the great the Changjiang, the great river, and it is associated with the Sun Quan or the Sun clan, and it's also sometimes referred as the southern kingdom because it's in the south. Now, what makes this novel uh, so interesting? both as a novel and as a historical account is, and let me quote C.T. Xia here, is because it attains the condition of good literature precisely because its slight fictional elaboration of history has restored for us the actuality of history. What does he mean by that? It has restored for us the actuality of history. Now, in China, in Chinese history, historical writing has always been extremely important. The knowledge of this writing uh, was paramount if you wanted to succeed, for example, in the civil service exams. But, um, you know, of course, I'm a little biased. I'm a literature scholar. Reading history can sometimes be a little dull. You know, it can be a little boring. Just facts and events and people and dates. And that is why, if we read historical fiction, that history is usually a lot more easy to swallow. Why? Because a writer brings that history for us to life. He creates characters, or he creates events where certain characters' behaviors are emphasized, their good sides, their bad sides. And this is exactly what has happened with those events that are the background to our novel, right? We talked about the fact that uh, all of these events really occurred, right, in the second and third century, and they've actually been recorded in a historical work called The Records of the Three Kingdoms, San Guo Zhi, which is an official and authoritative historical text that chronicles these events. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's not as much fun to read as our novel. Now, as early as the Tang Dynasty, 7th century to 10th century, which is maybe the second great dynasty, the second great empire in Chinese history, there have been retellings of these, popular retellings of these events. So in a way, our novel can be traced uh, as far back as the Tang Dynasty. Now, this historical work, the Sang Guo Zhi, the, the records of the Three Kingdoms, again, uh, is part of a much larger historical canon, the 24 histories, which, which is a big his historical anthology of the histories that were written about the preceding dynasties, going all the way up to the Ming. As we already mentioned, and as we will mention again over and over in this class, is that Three Kingdoms, you know, our novel, has experienced an enduring popularity ever since the 14th century. Uh, and it's many adaptations in opera, shadow plays, puppetry, uh, painting, poetry. I will show you some more uh, examples today during the presentation. Um, poetry, especially, and you will notice that there's actually there's actually a lot of poetry in in the that 14th century novel um, that we're reading. Some of that poetry, like for example, Su Dong Po's poem from page 110, precedes the novel, you know, by several centuries. Um, and of course, there's poetry that was written afterwards. So this interplay of many different genres uh, is a very important aspect, which in a way, again, informs the idea of popular culture and, and its importance within popular culture. I, I don't know if you've had the chance to read the various forewords for the novel. There is one by a certain John S. Service from 1940. It's just a couple of pages. You should read it. And he gives us a little account of his travels in Sichuan province during uh, the war against Japan, the Second World War, the Pacific War, and how the people he was traveling around there with, the soldiers, 
uh, we're all always really excited when they happen to come uh, across some pass or some, some town that had featured in the Three Kingdoms. Um, so these places, these historical places, really live on in China. And even until this day, you know, Chinese tourism is very much in tune with a lot of these places. So you can visit these sites. Some of, you know, most of them will have been rebuilt. Um, but, you know, you can visit the places where these events from the novel supposedly have taken place. There's a little image here uh, on the right for you. Um, the entrance to a pass that features later on in the novel, much later on. Uh, here are a couple of those examples I promised you. Here's Zhang Fei, one of our heroes, speaking to Liu Bei. Uh, and this is uh, from the Beijing Opera. Yeah, Liu Bei, one of our heroes here. He's holding one of his two swords. And here's uh, uh, Zhang Fei, a general, with those, those military banners sticking out from his back. And here is a Japanese woodblock print. So, um, you know, of another famous episode, our three main heroes, uh, uh, Liu Bei, Zhang Fei, Lord Guan, visiting Zhuge Liang. So you see that in Japanese art, in Japanese popular art, uh, these, these, these episodes are very much kept alive. Now, as I said, the novel, or these events described in the novel, are all pretty much historic events. So the Han Dynasty, as I said, one of the most important dynasties in Chinese history. It was divided into two periods. There was a rebellion in the middle, a Western Han and the Eastern Han. And it's towards the Eastern Han, the latter part of the Eastern Han, that, um, that our story really starts to take shape. And it's the decline of the Eastern Han that is accelerated by many factors, one of them being external threats of nomads coming from uh, from the north, from you know, from Mongolia, and for which a wall had been built, right? The the Great Wall, the beginnings of the Great Wall, but it hadn't been very <laughs> effective to keep out those nomads. Uh, walls rarely are successful at keeping out the people they're supposed to keep out. Now it's not just that there is uh, an increasing problem with corruption within the empire. Um, the uh, the eunuchs you will you will see that in our in our novel grab more and more power influence at the court and then in 184 during the reign of the second to last Han emperor Emperor Ling the Yellow River uh, which flows here you know in in the north floods a terrible flood many 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 hundreds of thousands of people drown. And those things are usually, uh, in Chinese history, are identified as omen, meaning that heaven wants to punish the rulers uh, for, for bad governance. Uh, the mandate of heaven that is bestowed upon them by heaven is, is, is being taken away from them. And this led to uh, a big rebellion, the Yellow Turban or Yellow Scarves Rebellion, under the leadership of a certain Zhang Jue. And again, these are all historic facts. This rebellion is eventually suppressed by a general called He Jin, who installs a child emperor and really usurps the central government. And this really is, 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 is the beginning of the end of the Han Dynasty then. He Jin is eventually assassinated by eunuchs, right? We mentioned those eunuchs wreaking havoc at the court. Um, and it's really upon, uh, at that moment, that the Han Dynasty breaks apart into these different warlord-controlled territory. Now, what had happened was that when this rebel rebellion broke out, military authority, more and more military authority, was bestowed upon the governors of the different provinces of the Han Dynasty, eight in total. And once they had been given more and more military power to suppress this rebellion, it was very difficult to take that power again away from them, right? And they all ended up doing their own thing and declaring their own kingdoms and wanting to usurp uh, power of the Han. Now, this is something that has happened again and again in Chinese history, that you know, when central government or the central government was weak, warlords would assume power in their provinces and eventually try to control more and more territory. The last time this has happened was, of course, 
during the late 19th, early 20th century. And it's probably also for this reason why this novel has endured for so long, because in a way, it shows us, it shows people the disrupted force that can prevail when the unity of the empire is challenged. So it sets, you know, a bad precedence, if you want. And it makes a case for unity and a united empire. And this is how, uh, you know, the Han Dynasty then looked, um, basically, at the end of the, the dynasty, when all those warlords had assumed power and basically had declared their own spheres of influence. We might recognize some names, right? We've already mentioned Cao Cao. Um, we, we will, and we here we have Sun, right? This is the Sun clan. We have Yuan Shao in the north. He is somebody who is kind of mentioned several times in the opening chapters. Gung Sun Zan, he is again somebody who should, you know, we, we encounter in chapter one and two. Uh, and Liu Biao, again, somebody very important in the first uh, 20 or 30 chapters of our novel. All of these, oh, and of course, Dong Zhuo here, yeah? All of these were essentially warlords vying for control over the empire. Here we have a couple more. Here's Liu Bei, right? Here's Liu Bei and here's Li Bu. So all of these, uh, some of these are people we will become more familiar with. Um, this is actually a fun little interactive map I found on Wikipedia, okay? And it shows you how the, 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 the power shifted, okay, over the years. So starting in 190 and here then you can sort of see how you know, Cao Cao and Sun Quan, you know, how they grab more and more territory, how they subdued others, and how at the end, okay, there's Liu Bei, okay, how at the end you are left with three kingdoms, okay? So if you want to see that map, you can just go to Wikipedia, Three Kingdoms, nice interactive map. Okay, it's taking a little longer. I think we're almost there, and here we go, and there is the Jin Dynasty, which replaced the Three Kingdoms period. And there it is again, our Three Kingdoms superimposed over a map of China. Now, um, the second core stream will deal in more detail with some of our main characters uh, and some of the main events that, sh that shape the opening chapters. So as you make your way through the novel, if you've never read this novel before, or you're not familiar with the story, um, you will probably be a little overwhelmed by the number of people and number of events. And you'll probably get confused because of a lot of the names sound similar. Battles that go back and forth. You know, don't get bogged down by the details. See if you can follow the larger thread of the story, the, the larger narrative, um, what's happening, the usurpation of power and the alliances that form. As for the main events that happen in the novel, our book, yeah, so it has a chronology in the back. You know, I use it heavily <laughs> because I sometimes get confused. Um, so this is the main events that happen. Likewise, there is a list of the main characters. Yeah, so if you want to know whether a person is important, you know, you might want to check him in the, uh, in, in the name list in the back. Now, if a person keeps coming back two or three times, you know, he, in very few cases, she, is actually important, and you know, if you just want to get on top of that character, look him up in the back of the book. You can, of course, also always Google these characters. Uh, for each of them, there is a Wikipedia entry or various other entries. Okay. Now, as for the geography and the geographical names, again, there's plenty of maps available online, but there's also a very nice map in our book. Okay. You might consult that. Um, and for anything else, just Google. Okay, so that's our first lecture, and I will see you shortly for the second one.